Good afternoon and welcome to the Canadian MPN Network Patient Advocacy Conference done virtually this year where we'd like to welcome everyone and I'd like to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your day to join us um, in just the closeness to MPN Awareness Day and to learn a little bit more about your cancer disease that you have in MPN's myeloproliferative neoplasms. So thank you very much for taking a couple of hours out of your day today. My name is Petrick. I'm the past chair and currently the executive director of the Canadian MPN Network. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank you for your time and your interest in joining us today on, on this webinar. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Claire Harrison. She is a professor at St. Guy, at Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital, London, United Kingdom. The focus of her work is to improve diagnosis risk definition therapy of myeloproliferative uh, neoplasms, for which she has a national and international reputation. Dr. Harrison is the chief investigator of several trials, including COMFORT-2 and the first JAK inhibitor in Europe. In 2011, she took over as chair of the NCRI MPD group. And Dr. Harrison works on translational work and clinical trials and collaborates internationally National centers, including Aiden Brooks, Mayo, and Mount Sinai. She is the founder of MPN Voice and is a, an advisory member for the MPN Foundation and collaborates with MPN research foundations across the world. She is an advisor to Leukemia Care and Bloodwise Medical Charities. And we'd like to thank Claire for joining us today from England. So thank you very much again for everyone joining us today, and I hope you do enjoy our two speakers. I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Claire Harrison. And thanks for the kind introduction, Cheryl. Um, it's great to be connected to you today um, from London. Um, I think this kind of technology, whilst it's stressful for us to set it up, um, it really connects us in, in different ways. Although, of course, it would be lovely to be with you um, face to face in your beautiful country. So Cheryl asked me to speak to you today about pipeline of treatment options for MPN. And excitingly, we have a lot to say. Um, so, because I'm going to talk about experimental therapies, I need to make a, some disclosures to you. This is my disclosure slide. Right. So, one of the first things I want to talk to you about is uh, some data from the European Haematology Association meeting, which was it's one of our major haematology meetings, and it was um, held uh, recently, uh, virtually, of course. And um, in this meeting, colleagues from Oxford presented some very nice data using what's called single cell technology to uh, look at megakaryocytes, which are the platelet making cells in patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms. And using this technology, they were able to identify different features of the megakaryocytes. Now, um, this is obviously not a new treatment, but it is a way that we might identify a new treatment um, and a new treatment target. And that's why I'm calling out this work to you today, just to highlight to you that we have some new smart ways of looking at different treatment targets. Now. Um, one of the most important uh, unmet needs, I think, for patients with MPN is the issue of um, symptom control. And I put this slide up just to highlight um, work done by colleagues, which has shown, um, if you look at this very nice plot, um, the darker line is patients with MPN and the pale grey line is patients who are general population controls. Not surprising to you guys, and ladies, that um, the MPN symptom burden is higher um, uh, for patients than for normal controls. Now, um, when asked in the landmark studies, and we are about to do the second landmark, Cheryl is involved um, in that and advocating for patients, 
And when patients were asked, which symptom would you most like to have resolved? Most of the patients referred to symptoms relating to fatigue and blood clot dissolution. So um, for us in our clinic, um, fatigue is a major issue and something that we really want to do something about. Um, so uh, if you look at the bottom of this slide, what we're doing in our team in uh, London is we're forming a study group to target fatigue, to do some more descriptive work because patients actually describe fatigue in different ways. Some people say, my legs are in blocks of concrete. Some people say, I've been hit by a fatigue bomb. So we want to um, make a package that's available for patients um, from the fatigue clinic that we have at Guy's. Um, that's helpful for some patients. And we also want to use this to um, also look at some science underpinning fatigue, because I don't think we really understand it very well. And in addition, we have the measure study, which I'm calling out at the top of the slide, looking at how symptoms and quality of life changes with treatment. So uh, let's start out then as we look at our pipeline of different therapies and thinking about therapy for PV and ET. So our conclusions at the end of 2019, um, we were still carrying out studies comparing interferon and hydroxyurea or hydroxycarbamide. We had two big studies showing no major differences. And then the third study called the Dahlia study from Denmark was presented at the European Hematology Association. In the last year, um, ROPEG interferon alpha-2b, otherwise known as VES-REMI, was approved in Europe for the treatment of PV. And two new drugs um, started being uh, tested in ET, and a number of different drugs are currently being tested in PV. So we're going to have a quick look at this kind of data, and then we're going to look at some new data that's just come out in 2020. So. Uh, I'm having a little problem advancing the slides, but I'm on an NHS computer. So um, the earlier slide, which I will try to get back to, but I'm not sure I can. Um, yes, thank you. Um, it shows um, MDM2 overexpression in patients with PV and MF. Now, MDM2 is a molecule that uh, regulates something called P53, and P53 is a really, really important protein. It's important in triggering uh, whether a cell lives or a cell dies, and it's central to much of cancer biology. So if we have um, MDM2 inhibitors, then P53 levels can go up, and that's um, an important um, factor. So uh, these two drugs, uh, KRT232, we'll come back to that in MF as well, and idazomutlin, a separate MDM2 inhibitor um, from Roche, have been tested in patients with PV. And in fact, John Mascarenas and the group from Mount Sinai reported some data with idazomutlin, sometimes in combination with interferon in PV. In addition, um, Gipinostat, which is an HDAC inhibitor, um, which controls basically how DNA is folded. We're going to do like a bit of, kind of looking at science um, pictures as well today. So here on this slide, you'll see DNA on the right-hand side. It's gradually coiled up. Then it goes around little beads, which are known as histones. And then it gets folded up finally into chromosomes. So um, Gimilostat is what's called a HDAC inhibitor, and it's important because it inhibits um, acetylation of these histones and um, is important in controlling activity of DNA. It's anti-inflammatory, it's um, anti-programmed cell death, and it has an effect on new blood cell formation. And in patients who were given Gimilostat, you can see some of the data on the bottom of the slide, um, control of itching um, was good, tolerability was good, and it, it was felt to be clinically effective um, in combination with hydroxycarbamide, actually, in patients who previously not responded well to that drug. So there is um, a study opening in PV called um, Give In um, currently. Another important thing that happened in 2019 was some data from a study that we've had running in the UK known as the Magic PV study. 
Um, MAGIC is a kind of umbrella study, and we included ET patients and reported that roxolitinib um, wasn't better than standard therapy for ET patients in that study. In the PV half of the study, we compared the roxolitinib in patients who weren't managed with uh, hydroxycarbamide and found that roxolitinib, in line with the other studies that have done, was better. But in this paper that was presented at EHA last year by Neto Garcia, who's a clinical fellow with us in London, where she looked at whether the jackalil burden had dropped at the end of one year, she found a significant correlation, if you focus on the right-hand side of the slide, in those patients who even have a 25%, so just a quarter drop in their allele burden. So, for example, if they've gone from 80% to less than 60%, these patients have no thrombotic events and less chance of disease progression. And on the other hand, it's always good to see that the correlation is, is also true the other way. If patients hadn't had any response in their allele burden or their allele burden had gone up, they had a greater risk of um, those two events. So this is important because it's the first time that we have seen um, a correlation between uh, molecular results and these events. And here you can see on this slide, these are called Kaplan-Meier plots. So you can see on this side, according to the treatment group, there was no difference in progression-free survival, so no difference in change to myelofibrosis, failure of therapy or to uh, leukemia between roxolitinib and best available therapy. If you look on the right-hand side, if you got a 25% reduction in your allele burden, regardless of how you got it, whether it was with roxolitinib or with another therapy, you were less likely to have disease progression. So this is important, and it's the first time there's been a, a link between JAK2, v 617 f allele version, otherwise known as BAF, and we're very fond of three-letter acronyms in medicine, as you know, and clinical outcome um, outside of the transplant setting. Now, actually, in other blood diseases, particularly blood diseases in the same family, myeloid blood diseases, such as acute myeloid leukemia or MDS, actually, this kind of correlation is important and is used as a target for therapy. So it's about time we started looking at that probably in the MPM field. In 2020, what's been happening? In 2020, um, interestingly, Professor Balbui presented at the EHA meeting a study called Low PV. And in this study, he took patients who had low risk PV and randomly allocated them to just getting standard of care, which is phlebotomy, keep the hematocrit down to less than 0.45, and aspirin. We all know that's standard care. And the, the other patients received row peg interferon alpha 2b. This is the best remy uh, drug that was approved recently. And the primary endpoint was shown on this slide. So this is what they were targeting was responders. And responders um, was a hematocrit of less than 0.45 in absence of disease progression. And then um, after this time point, um, the patients could cross over. So this was preliminary results presented at the EHA meeting. And um, here you can see, I don't think it's rocket science, that actually patients who were treated with the interferon were more likely to have control of their um, disease. However, the interesting things come uh, on the right-hand side of this slide. So there appeared to be less disease progression, so 0%, although disease progression also was uh, defined as really high platelet count uh, in the uh, row peg interferon arm compared to standard treatment, which is basically aspirin and phlebotomy. And then also, which is the, I think the key um, feature, certainly um, as a take home for myself, um, is that symptoms tended to improve. So if you look at this slide, you need to orientate yourself. So these are the symptoms along the bottom axis that they were measuring. The red arrow, that is actually improvement in symptoms. So below the line is improvement and above the line is worse. So fatigue was worse on interferon, but on the whole, symptoms were improving. So the important message for me is, there could be something interesting coming in terms of longer term follow-up of these patients, because we really want to know, does interferon 
um, reduce risk of disease progression. But another important message goes back to this issue of symptoms, that sometimes controlling symptoms can be done with um, cytoreductive drugs such as interferon. And this is just a summary slide uh, from Professor Malbuing. Um, so we need to be looking at their secondary endpoints with great interest. Another thing that was presented at the virtual EHA meeting was some data from our lovely colleagues in France who were looking basically at how interferon is working and differences in how it was working in patients according to which um, mutation they had, a JAK2 mutation or a CALAR mutation, and also how much of that mutation, back to this FAF thing again. And so they found that um, uh, there were differences in the dose that was needed, for example. So this is quite complex, but my take-home message is on the bottom of the slide. So this will help us to better understand how an important drug like interferon works and will ultimately help us to harness better outcomes. Now I want to move to talk about myelofibrosis and um, new drugs for myelofibrosis. Now, one of our big unmet needs um, as we treat patients with myelofibrosis is the management of anemia. We're using an algorithm which is shown in black on this slide involving erythropoietin, danazole, which is an anabolic steroid. And we've been using that uh, for a long time. This was published in a paper written by a good uh, colleague from uh, Spain in 2014. But recently, we've been testing a drug called Lospatacept in this setting. And Lospatacept is a very interesting drug. It's recently been approved for management of inherited anemia, beta thalassemia, and also MDS. It, it binds out very inflammatory uh, molecules, and, and which are inhibiting red cell production. And uh, when we tested this agent in myelofibrosis, we found some interesting things. So this is basically just a diagram of what Lospatacept looks like. And it shows, if you look at the bottom right of the slide, where it's working at kind of the end stages of red cell production. So in, we did a study in myelofibrosis, we're still doing it, uh, where we compared the ability of Lospatacept to work in patients who were either on ruxolitinib or not and were either anemic, receiving transfusion, or just anemic. And the provisional uh, results from this study are interesting. It's a complicated slide, um, but I just wanted to include it to show you that we have got some really interesting new molecules. So basically, the other interesting thing here was if you look at the red boxes, you can see that um, the first column are the patients who were, were anemic but not needing transfusion, um, not on ruxolitinib. The second column, which is labelled cohort 3A, these are the same patients, anemic, not transfusion dependent, but on ruxolitinib. So you can see that the responses are actually greater. And then if you look for the transfusion uh, dependent patients, again, you can see similar patterns suggesting that there's probably some kind of synergy or added benefit between roxolitinib and lospatacept. You could think that maybe that's because of the anti-inflammatory effect of roxolitinib, but uh, we need to understand this a bit more. And lospatacept is actually um, being developed in partnership with Celgene or uh, Bristol Myers Squibb now, who also are developing fedratinib. So there is an ongoing study with fedratinib and the spatacept. One of our big problems in myelofibrosis is uh, whilst ruxolitinib or jacophy is a good drug, um, many patients, for many patients, it will stop working. And um, this slide just shows you the proportion of patients over time in various different trials for whom uh, jacophy has stopped working. Um, now, it hadn't stopped working in all patients by five years, but on average, the benefit in a clinical trial will last between three and four years. This is actually pretty consistent. Um, uh, but actually, in real life, uh, some patients will have you know, uh, benefits at either end of that extreme. So fortunately, there are actually lots of drugs that we're looking at um, to manage uh, patients when roxolitinib has stopped working. 
But before we talk about that, I just want to raise a really important safety concern. So please listen up if you are taking roxolitinib. Please, please do not suddenly stop taking this drug. You've probably been told this by your caregiver, but it's really important that you don't. And we actually um, had an oral presentation at the EHA meeting about this, um, showing that actually uh, roughly 8% of patients run into big problems when they stop roxolitinib. And in particular, um, we have been at pains in the UK to talk to our patients if they're suffering from coronavirus, which is an inflammatory condition, not to stop their roxolitinib. So please communicate that if you end up in hospital, don't stop that drug suddenly, because you will get a flare of inflammation. Now, this is a complicated slide. This basically is meant to make you go, wow, look at all these drugs that are being uh, tested in MPN at the present time. And this is not an exhaustive list. Um, most of these drugs are being tested in myelofibrosis, but there are a couple of them, and we'll mention them as we're going along, that are also being tested in ET. So we will not be looking at all of them, but I'm just going to pick out a few highlights and maybe Dr. Gutsu will also mention a few of these too. Now we have um, got a number of different JAK inhibitors. Um, Fedratinib was approved by the FDA last year, but it's still being tested in a study known as the Freedom Study. I know that this is also open in Canada. So we could be using uh, Fedratinib uh, either in the Freedom Study or uh, first or second line, and it looks to be effective in patients who have a lower plate that count, where sometimes roxolitinib can be a challenge. Momolotinib is another JAK inhibitor, which actually Dr. Gupta has been taking a lead on developing, and it's being tested, particularly for its ability to do what roxolitinib does, but improve anemia in the study called the Momentum Study. And then lastly, in terms of JAK inhibitors, quitinib, which appears to be effective in patients with very low platelet counts. And this is an area where we have a big gap. So um, hopefully we'll be seeing uh, this study taking off in the next year or so. So now I don't, I don't want to talk about JAK inhibitors anymore. I want to talk about uh, some of the other um, targets around this uh, kind of cartwheel. I'm going to talk about a couple of drugs that were presented at the EHA meeting. And they've got quite difficult to pronounce names. Um, so here's the first one. This was presented by Dr. Yacoub. And this is a drug called Arsaclisib, which is a PI3 kinase inhibitor. So PI3 kinase is another pathway in the cells. And we think sometimes that patients who become resistant to ruxolitinib, uh, that's because the signaling is going down the PI3 kinase pathway. So this drug looks to be delivering um, some effective uh, responses for patients and is still being developed. And the same is also true of the second drug, which is a different target. So it's targeting uh, a molecule known as CD123. And this drug is also got a weird name, Tegraxofusp. Um, and this looks actually quite interesting. I'm quite excited by this one because it's a different target. Um, and I'm really wanting to watch the space, and hopefully I would like to get my hands on this in London for my patients. Now, we spoke about um, MDM2 inhibition or activation of cell death, um, and this drug, KRT232, in the context of polycythemia vera. And um, here is the data with this drug in terms of myelofibrosis patients. So looking beneficial and will be in a study later this year. Here is another drug that I think is interesting. Sorry, this is like this is just a kind of taster exciter menu of different drugs. And this is a drug known as IMG7289. Bomendenostat, also quite tricky uh, one to pronounce. Um, it's an oral drug and it has quite a similar anti-inflammatory gene response to roxolitinib. And that's what this slide is meant to be showing you, with the exception of the fact that it enhances interferon gamma response. And this drug, interestingly enough, um, 
we give it to patients and we titrate the dose against the patient's platelet count. So guess what? We're going to be testing this drug um, for patients with ET who um, are not responding well to standard therapies. And an, a great thing about this drug is it also appears to improve anemia and it also appears to improve symptoms with very, very little in the way of side effects. So watch the space for this one. Let's have a look at the next slide. Now, lots of discussion about uh, BET inhibition and uh, broma domain inhibition is also important and in terms of its epigenetic activity. So epigenetics was again all about the thing about the DNA winding around the histone beads, etc. This drug also has an effect on inflammation and there has been some interest in this drug um, in coronavirus treatment. It has a big effect on megakaryocytes, which are the platelet-producing cells, which are uh, really implicated in NPM biology. And so um, BCAS and uh, Canadian centres, as well as many centres across the world, have been very interested in this drug. We've got quite a lot of data from this very complicated study known as MANIFEST, but, and then don't worry, I'm not going to go through it all in a lot of detail, but the important thing is the good data keeps on coming. And this drug appears to be active on its own, which is in um, cohort one, in combination with ruxolitinib for patients where ruxolitinib hasn't done what we wanted it to do, or hasn't done what it says on the tin. And we're also looking at this drug up front. So trying to beat what ruxolitinib can do up front. And so far, it looks very exciting. And so we will be launching an upfront study uh, in a randomized fashion uh, later in the year. And I think actually, Vikas, this is one of your patients. Um, you had a really, really good response to this drug. So you can see um, all the different facets of response here. Spleen volume reduction, symptom reduction, improvements in bone marrow, um, so you're um, before and after, you can see a reduction in the amount of black fibre and also in the bottom two panels, the blue stain, which is collagen. The patient became transfusion independent and also the bad inflammatory cytokines, which we see so often in patients with MF, uh, fell to normal ranges. So I'm really excited about this drug um, and I think we're going to see a lot more. On, on that drug, and that is also a drug we're going to be testing in ET. So I've just got a couple more drugs to tell you about um, before we get the chance to have some discussion and answer some questions. The first is Navitaclax. Um, so Navitaclax is a, a sibling of Venetoclax, which is a drug that um, we've got very excited about using in acute myeloid leukemia. It's also really important in this kind of apoptosis or cell death pathway, and it inhibits uh, BCL-X and BCL-2. And, and we've been testing it in actually in a different uh, group of diseases known as lymphomas. But uh, interestingly, in a clinical trial in combination with ruxolitinib, we saw a lot of benefit for our patients. And I'm just summarizing them for you in brief on this slide. So we saw symptoms and spleen responses, some reduction in bone marrow fibrosis, some reduction in abnormal uh, gene um, mutation levels or FAF, which we don't know whether that's important in myelofibrosis, but logic says it would be. But it does come at the cost of lowering the platelet count. So this is something we need to know how to do a bit better. And this drug will also be in a clinical trial next year. We're going to be busy. Now, uh, telomerase, lastly. Um, so telomerase is an enzyme that protects the end of chromosomes. If you look at the picture that's just popped up on the slide, you can see again, you should be expert at this now. This is the DNA wrapped around the histones and coming into the protein, into the chromosome. And if you look at the very tips of the chromosome in the top right of the slide, there are some red dots. These are the telomeres, and these are really important to uh, keep a cell active and keep a cell dividing. And telomerase is an enzyme that protects the telomeres. 
in uh, I once explained this as um, the little plastic bit or the metal bit at the tips of your shoelace that protect the shoelace from fraying away. Now, uh, telomerase and uh, the fact that chromosomes are protect protected by telomeres and telomerase was actually um, uh, this work was awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine uh, just over a decade ago. So we have a drug um, which then can target this, and this just shows you the activity of um, telomerase um, increases uh, as the normal cells are maturing, if you look at the figure on, that's just appeared, and then it reduces as normal cells um, mature out into the bloodstream, and then ultimately these cells die when they get older. But in uh, abnormal or cancer cells, or myelofibrosis cells, if you like, what happens is telomerase is active and the chromosomes don't age and the cells don't die. So uh, there is a telomerase inhibitor known as imetostat, which has been used in myelofibrosis. And the data with this drug has been coming over the last five years or so. Um, in this study known as the IMBOX inbox study, and comparing the data from the inbox study with a database from one of the big American hospitals, prolongation of survival was seen. And really excitingly, uh, there will be a trial with a metal stat uh, starting at the end of this year. And the endpoint, really important, will be survival, but, um, which is, I think, very, very heartening and really, really exciting. So there are lots and lots of combinations of different drugs, um, drugs that we're using on their own, drugs that we're using in combination, etc. But our big question is, who should we be testing them in? And you can see that we're doing tests in the spectrum. We're testing some drugs up front, so the Vitaclax and the CPI 0610 drug will be tested up front, as well as after ruxolitinib. And the endpoints, are we going to move away from spleen and symptoms? Are we going to look at molecular endpoints? Are we going to look, yes, yeah, certainly in the metal stat study at survival? And we're also planning to do some really complicated studies. So don't worry, I'm not going to talk you through this slide. But this is a door, which is one of the big Novartis studies. And it's an example of ambition and complexity, where we're testing multiple drugs in sequence really, really aiming to deliver a better therapeutic outcome and benefit for patients. So in summary for myelofibrosis, I think this is a really exciting time. Lots of different drugs that are available. I wanted to emphasize the issue about stopping ruxolitinib, and that can be a practical issue, but also an ethical issue in a clinical trial. And some of the new therapies we're using to try to augment the benefit of ruxolitinib upfront. And lastly, um, I want to uh, comment on just to say, don't underestimate the power of collaboration, scientists, doctors, patients, industry, and the importance of the, patient, importance of the patient voice. So congratulations to Cheryl and the rest of the team in, in MPN Canada uh, for your collaboration and um, for networking and making sure the patient voice is heard. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Harrison. Thank you so much for taking time your um, busy schedule. And for the folks here in Canada, just to let you know that Dr. Harrison is actually doing double duty, a physician on call tonight. Um, so she's taking a few moments out of her yes. time to help us. So thank you very, very much. I do have a couple of questions that have come to us from our um, from our group of folks watching. Um, one of them is after the most recent studies, do you think Pegasus is still a useful treatment option for MPN patients? And if so, MPNs? So I missed the last half of the question, Cheryl. I do, I do think so, it's a um, useful treatment option. But... Uh, so Pegasus be useful uh, for MPN patients, and if so, in which MPN? Hmm. I don't think that Pegasus is for everyone. Um, we have failed to show that it's definitely better than hydroxyureal hydroxycarbamide um, in upfront studies, maybe because we've not been following patients for long enough. Um, and there are certainly some patients who have contraindications to that drug. 
It's well known for triggering autoimmune disease. It can cause problems with anxiety and depression, and it can cause problems with the liver and the thyroid. So it's not for everyone. If you need to have a drug and uh, you want to get pregnant, then uh, interferon is really the only effective therapy. It's a big challenge to manage pregnancy without that. Um, and I think really the effectiveness of interferon is in earlier stages of the myeloproliferative neoplasm, if you think about it as a continuum. So for ET and PV, but not really for advanced myelofibrosis. I'm interested in Professor Barbui's study, but for me, the interest is in management of symptoms, and I want to see his data a bit more clearly about disease progression. Great, thank you. And one other um, question of here is Italian researcher Alessandra Ranieri um, of the Hospital of Siena recently presented results where she found a mutation in a gene called JAK2 that is involved in the immune overshun or cytokine storm that has contributed to many of the COVID-19 deaths. Do any of our experts know about the study and whether this is in JAK2 V617F mutation that many MPN have or a similar effect mutation? And what would the implications for uh, this be for patients uh, in terms of COVID-19? Well, okay, so uh, you've caught me on the hot deck. So I don't know that study, um, but I do know that we do sequence JAK2 uh, frequently and uh, our next generation sequencing panels do sometimes pick up variants in JAK2. Um, so they are quite common. Um, I think that um, I need to see the paper to comment, really. I think that... Um, it's unlikely that this is contributing to risk with regard to coronavirus and MPM patients. Um, but I would like to say a few words maybe about coronavirus. Would you like me to do that, Cheryl? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Please do. Yeah. So I think um, different countries have handled um, coronavirus differently. In the UK, all blood cancer patients have been asked to do what's called shielding, which is very, very tricky for patients had to stay in their house and um, not go outside, use different bathroom from the rest of their families, etc. And so we didn't have very many patients, um, fortunately, who had the coronavirus. Um, but it is obviously a concern, given that uh, coronavirus is associated with inflammation and sticky blood, which is, and blood clots, which are all features of MPM. Uh, across Europe, we have recently done a survey uh, of all the clinicians looking at the outcomes for our MPN patients. And we've generally found uh, that outcomes are linked to things that we already know are linked to poor outcome. So unfortunately, ethnicity, advanced age, uh, comorbidities such as heart disease, hypertension, smoking, et cetera. But we particularly found for MPN patients that perhaps our myelofibrosis patients didn't do so well. And um, in particular, and this is why I was emphasizing the point about roxalitinib, patients who have stopped roxalitinib concurrently with developing coronavirus did not do well. And so uh, this is something, I think this study is really, really important because um, it uh, provides something that's an important practical hint for patients if you become unwell. But also, um, it's quite. Re I'm hoping it's quite reassuring to other patients that probably their MPN is not adding uh, to that risk. Now, I can't see Cheryl anymore. I do. I do see you. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Great. I was wondering if so I was going to have some conversation with myself. <laughs> <laughs> So that's it for our questions. So once again, thank you very much, Dr. Harrison, for um, coming and talking to our Canadian MPN patients. As we know, MPN patients around the world struggle with the same burden of, of the illness and the same, same quality of life issues. And I know that you, along with Dr. Gupta, are so very highly respected, um, not only in your own country, but world, that um, people follow your, your lead and your direction. And and we're very thankful and honoured that you have taken the time to speak with our Canadian MPN patients. 
Well, that's my great pleasure. As I said before, I think partnership and collaboration is really, really important. So I want to wish you a very successful Congress. It looks really exciting. And I want to tell everyone, please take care, look after yourselves and your families. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Again, bye. So we will take a, a few minute break, but at this time, I just want to again, thank Dr. Dr. Harrison's contribution to making our uh, patient conference today very successful. I'd like to, in advance, thank Dr. for taking time out of his um, busy schedule as well. And I will introduce him just prior to his, his opportunity to speak to you. Um, and at this time, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Novartis. Um, they've been a great partner and a great sponsor of the Canadian MPN network for many and so I'd like to take the time and opportunity to thank our partners our industry partners from Novartis for sponsoring this event um, watch our website in the next 10 to 15 days or so or week to 10 days uh, for a recording of this session and the information presented also be watchful in the months of October November when we have the second part of our patient conference and that will be devoted topics. So we hope that you'll be able to register and join in on those subjects. Rather than having everything on one full day, we know that um, people sitting in front of a computer is really tough for us um, to sit for a long period of time in front of a computer. So the Canadian MPN Network has chosen our patient conference into two separate um, events and our wellness subjects will be handled and presented on another day. So please do watch our uh, for that information and watch our website in the next uh, week to 10 days for the information from this event uh, where we will have it posted. Um, I hope that you are enjoying or have enjoyed the first talk by Dr. Harrison and Dr. Gupta come up shortly and do his presentation. So we'll take a few minutes break and we hope that you'll Turn with us here, Dr. Vikas Gupta of Princess Margaret Hospital, and what he has to say about MPNs and the Canadian landscape. So come back and join us in a few moments.